greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God is good Amen. all the time. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Were you not blessed by that ministry in song? And were you not blessed by Dr. Wesley's sermon, sermon there, his sermon, Fireproof Faith? How many were blessed by that? Such a blessing. And, uh, you know, Dr. Knight and I are wonderful friends. We actually had he and his wife, Stephanie, uh, to come to South Africa uh, to conduct a series of messages in our local church. And his theme was entitled Sex in the City. I was wondering whether I should invite him or not, but we took the risk. And, and we were blessed. Hallelujah. We were blessed. And I would highly recommend Dr. Knight to share that series at some point in the United Kingdom, Sex in the City. It was one of the most enlightening week of prayers we had around the correlation between sexuality and spirituality. Thank you so much, Dr. Knight, for sharing that message this morning. Truly, we were all blessed. Gosh, we're coming towards the end of this camp meeting. I mean, can you believe the speed by which we're coming to the close? And we've just gotten started, just getting on top of the mountain. And now we're gonna have to leave the mountain after tomorrow, back to the realities of life. But hopefully we have left with insights and we have left with understanding and we have been illuminated and inspired around the great things that God can do. And each of the speakers that have come have shared the perspective that gives light to each and every one of us and buoys our spirits to know that we are marching to Zion. What do you say out there? You know, just, just as I, I, I'm about to begin, you know, I couldn't help but share one, one last testimony. You know, I love to share testimonies because, you know, testimonies are the stories that help others to know that God lives. And, and you know, you know I, I, and I've gone backwards and forwards on different aspects of the testimony, but this one I've just got to share. It's pretty short, but, but it reminds me of something important about the provision of God, the provision of God. And I remember, you know, during the first four years of the missionary work, my, my goal was not to work, but to work for God and God alone. Uh, that was seven days a week. And, and I remember my wife saying to me, so when the four years are done, what will you do? And I said, well, I, I, I don't know. And if the truth be told, I was actually afraid because my big question was, well, what will I truly do after four years? Uh, what type of job will, will I look for? Because at some point I needed to look for a job and try and balance. And so I remember praying and I said, well, Lord, you know, and my wife was next to me while I was praying and I could hear the silence. Uh, there was no amens to my prayer, you see. And, 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 and so that told me something about my prayer. I was saying, Lord, well, you know, you know I've got to work, Lord, that's important, but Lord, I, I don't want a nine to five, and I, I, I want uh, in my job the ability to do your work at a call and still be able to earn, and Lord, actually, I don't want any holiday time. I want to be able to freely choose when, but I want to earn, and I got a sense that my wife was kneeling next to me, and her eyes were not shut, but she was kind of looking at me like, what? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But, but I was trying to deal with this reality that, Lord, I don't want to stop doing your work. I, I want to have that latitude, but I want to be able to ensure that I'm supplying the needs of my family. And so as we were trying to search for jobs, my wife would go looking in the newspaper and, and she'd put before me just on the, the dresser there, well, why don't you have a look at that, you know, be a school counselor at a college or something. And I'd push it aside because it had nine to five in it. And she said, but Errol, you've got to get real here. You have has a job where there is no working hours, but you choose when you want to work, and then you're gonna have the freedom to go and preach whenever you want to. I said, no, God, babes, God can provide. Now notice who's the one getting faith these days. My wife was the one who got us into all of this, but now I'm sharing with her. But God can, you know, God can. And, 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 and so it was, I was in a place where I was doing uh, seven weeks of preaching in, in, in 1997, I think it was 1997, and I was coming towards the end, uh, and, 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 and I came home, and as I came home, um, uh, my wife said, Errol, I've found what you are looking for. 
I said, what do you mean, what you found, what I'm looking for? Now, I don't know how women are able to do this, but she was listening to the radio simultaneously while blow drying her hair. <laughs> now, only women can actually do that because I, I'm not sure how you can hear the radio with the blow dry going on. But, but she said, she said, she says, Errol, I was listening on the radio and, and the, the, they were interviewing this company called the Pacific Institute and, and, and the MD of the company was saying, all true and meaningful and lasting change starts first on the inside and works its way out. And I said, well, that's, that's nice, that's nice. But she said, that's what you say as well. I said, oh, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, so why don't you phone them and see if there are any opportunities? I said, did they mention my name on the the radio, you know, like that, anything like that. She said, no, 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 but, but, but I think this is the one that God has for you. I said, babes, I'm not just going to phone up some organization out. What am I going to say to them? And she said, don't worry. Say the right things and, and see what happens. And, you know, me being stubborn, you know, well, why can't God speak to me, you know? But I said, okay, this time I'll do it. So we're driving in the car and I muster up the courage, you know, to phone. So I phone and I try to put on a deep voice, you know, sort of into intellectual and so forth and and then said well you know I'm just checking in you know I believe that you were on the radio last night and I'm trying to find out if there could be any synergies you know trying to use those big words synergies I don't know what I'm talking about but synergies you know synergies synergies <laughs> and, 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 you know, the lady, the lady on the phone says, well, you know, yes, it is true that we're looking, but, you know, actually, uh, we're not looking for people like you. And I thought, people like me, you don't even know me. You know, we're not looking for, we're looking for people of color. We're looking for black people. Early days of South Africa, things are changing. I said, well, what if I told you that the phone I'm holding, my color and the cell phone are the same, black, you know? She said, oh, 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 well, would you like to come in? I said, oh, oh, I'll come in, you know? I don't know what I'm coming into, by the way, you know? But I'm coming, so I get my suit on, and then I get a shock. I said, but what am I gonna tell them? I mean, four years. I haven't worked for four years. I've worked for God, but in the real sense, I haven't worked in an earthly sense. And so what am I gonna tell them? What's gonna be on my CV? Oh, missionary for the Lord. Hmm, that may not go down well. But I went anyway, so I went, you know, in my suit and so forth, and I sat down, and this lady came out, you know, and she introduced herself. We began to talk, and she began to talk about cognitive psychology, uh, organizational design, systems theory, and I'm looking, I'm going, my Lord, what on earth is she talking about? <laughs> And it's just going over my head completely. And then she said, but you know, I don't think this would be for you anyway. And I said, well, why? She said, well, actually, we're looking for Christians. <laughs> Hallelujah! I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Oh, you are? Yes, 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 yes. I said, okay, okay. She says, well, what, what have you been doing? You know, do you work with people? Oh, have I worked with people? Of course I've worked with people. For the last four years, I've been working with people. I've been preaching, I've been teaching, I've been this. She said, oh, that's, 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 that's interesting. She said, would you like to meet the MD of the company? I said, well, yes, but I still don't know what you do. <laughs> you know, she said, no, I'd like you to meet the MD. And so the next day I suited up again, came, Paulette said to me, so how did it go? I said, I don't know, really, <laughs> what they do, you know? And, and so the next day I went in and, and, and I heard this roar of a Harley Davidson. Anybody know what a Harley Davidson is? You hear it before you see it. And there this gentleman comes off, his name was Brian Wegley, and he was the then MD of the Pacific Institute, a former banker by profession, and he came in and he sat down and his first words to me is, have you had a wilderness experience? <laughs> and then what kind of question is that? I mean, you don't go for an interview and somebody says, do you have a wilderness experience? I said, well, you could say so. He said, tell me about your experience. And I, so I told him about the journey and the four years and so forth. And he said, you know, do you know anything about psychology? I said, nothing. He said, do you understand anything about systems theory? Nothing. Do you know anything about leadership development? Nothing. Have you had any experience? Well, only in helping people. That's all I know. He said, there's something about you. I don't know what it is, but there's something about you. You can't do any of the things we're looking for, but there's something about you. He said, why don't you go through the process that I'm about to take you on? Tell me what you think about it. 
And so he put me on this process for six weeks where I went through the whole thing. And everything that they shared with me, I could see the biblical underpinnings. It was almost like the matrix, you know, where you can see all the different things going on. I could see, I could see all the biblical underpinnings. And when he'd finished, he says, so tell me, um, what do you think? I said, well, it's good. He says, well, do you think that you could sell this process? Do you think you could develop in this? I said, yes, yes, yes. He said, I'm going to make you an offer. This, take, this is a salary package I'm going to offer you, or you take 25% of any business you bring in, salary or commission. I said, well, listen, I don't want a salary. He said, well, what do you want? I said, well, I don't want to work uh, nine to five, and um, I want to know that if I'm called to preach, I can go, and I want to know that I deliver what's necessary, and, and so long as I deliver what's necessary, I'm free to do the other things I need to do. He said, done. I went home to my wife. I said, I got a job. She said, how much? I said, nothing right now. <laughs> no, nothing right now. So what do you mean nothing? I said, well, I, I don't want to be constrained, babes. The Lord, the Lord is provided. Provided what? Well, well, I'll, I'm going to be commissioned. She said, but we need money. I said, but no, you got to understand. If God is in this thing, he will bless. Amen. Amen. And you know, this man, Brian Wegerly, he invested from 1998 until his untimely death in 2007. He sent me around the world, put me at the seat of some of the best leading professors in this discipline, sent me to the United States and around the world and taught me himself and then promptly died. And before he died, which we would never have known, he turned around and said, there are only two people that I would have or so to take over this business. And it's you and Sam Alexander who are Adventists. Because I've learned so much about Adventists, I'd rather have this business in Adventist hands than any other hands. We want to praise God today. Because I think we're coming to the mountaintop now. It's time to praise the Lord. So turn with me to Psalms chapter 65. Psalms chapter 65. I want to talk a bit about reflections of the past. The scripture reading is Psalms chapter 65 verses 1 to 5. And it reads, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. And unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me. And as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. By terrible things in righteousness, thou wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence in, of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we spend this last few moments together in this final message, we pray that you will bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. This particular passage of scripture uh, focuses on the children of Israel as they gave thanks to God for a great year and as they also looked forward to renewed blessings in the year to come. It is, my friends, a passage that is also written at the conclusion of that great year. Almost like a camp meeting, the 
people assembled themselves and looked back at the wondrous way in which God had blessed them and they came uh, to give thanks. It is important to understand that success in biblical times uh, depended upon the rains. If there were no rains, then no matter how hard they worked and devised means to make their crops grow, their efforts would be in vain if there was no rain. This particular year, however, uh, there had been prosperity. The rains had come and poured down, as it were, from heaven. And therefore, at the end of this season, they assembled together like camp meeting to consider the year ahead. What's amazing about this passage of scripture is that the message is drawn uh, from five words, all of which begin with a P within the first few verses of Psalms chapter 65. And I just want to share some of those P's with you, which are five, and then bring them into our context. Uh, Verse one talks about the word praise. Praise waiteth for thee. As the people looked forward to the coming of a new season, God is almost pictured as the future coming towards them, armed with good things. The people in my mind's eye are pictured as standing, waiting silently for the great things that God was preparing. Uh, They themselves, as the children of Israel, were waiting to shower him with praise for all all of his wonderful works. Uh, They did not somehow perceive themselves as walking into an unknown year, and as many of us tend to do, but, but they saw God, whom they knew very well, coming towards them, and they were ready to spend their time praising him for everything that has come and that which shall come by faith. The second P, my friends, is the word performed. Unto thee shall the vow be what? Performed. As they looked to the future, they remembered the vows they made during the difficult times of the previous year. They remembered the silent promises that they had made to God in moments of frustration, in moments of difficulty, in moments of hardships. They remembered, my friends, the decisions to break off those bad habits and change those attitudes and tear down those false altars and remain true to God. Thus, they approached the new season with a renewed commitment to keep their promises to God and live up to the various pledges that they had made. But there is a third P, and that is the P of prayer. O thou that hearest prayer, there in verse 2, they looked, it would seem, to the new season with a resolve to be prayerful. Uh, Their united voices says, thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. They looked into the unknown with assurance that no matter what the future brings, that talking to God would enable them to face any circumstances. Can I get an amen out here? They resolved, my friends, to enter the new season after this camp meeting with a prayerful spirit. They believed that it was God who heard the prayers of his people, and thus uh, they looked at the new new year uh, with courage and with hope, understanding that prayer can change anything so long as God is on the throne. What do you say out there? Uh, Then there's another P, my friends, the word uh, prevailing. Uh, There you find in verse 3, iniquities prevail against me. 
Uh, despite the optimism that they had, uh, the people, however, were acutely aware that with every new season uh, comes with its certain inequities and iniquities. Uh, when I talk about inequities, I'm talking about those things that come upon us unjustly, those things that we have had no share in causing, those things that come upon us with no rhyme and no reason, and it is nothing to do with us, but we are experiencing inequities. And then there are iniquities, uh, the other things that we actually bring upon ourselves as a result of our own bad decisions or our own deviation from the word of God. And so the word prevail uh, seems to suggest that our iniquities and our faults will overpower us and be victorious at first. However, the Hebrew translation of the word prevail is gabar, which means strong and mighty and powerful. Uh, it does not mean victorious as in the English. It means trouble may give believers a hard fight as they always do, but picking a hard fight and winning a hard fight are not one and the same. And what the text is saying is that we will be victorious and we shall overcome the inequities and iniquities that come our way by the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, then there is the final P, which is the P called purge. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. And this, my friends, answers the questions raised about what will happen to the strong inequities and iniquities that will come against believers. Thou shalt purge them away. My friends, the people had no doubt there would be shortcomings and there would be flaws in their collective character that would surface uh, post the camp meeting that they had. Uh, but they were assured that the grace of God would purge them away. Uh, they were confident that in the new season there would be errors, misjudgments, critical mistakes. But the people concluded, thou shalt purge them away. What do you say out there, my friends? And that's why First John John chapter 1 verse 19 states, if we confess our sins, uh, God is faithful and just uh, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us of our unrighteousness. Now collectively, these five Ps demonstrates, listen to me, demonstrates the people's attitude as they reflected on the past and looked forward uh, to the new year. It was a, an attitude of optimism dipped in gratitude. It was an attitude of expectation for they looked forward to great things that lay ahead and they were waiting to give God all of the glory and all of the praise. Now, as we are as a community of believers here representing the South England Conference, uh, look on the past of where we have come from since the last camp meeting to now and look forward from this camp meeting. I would like to suggest, my friends, that we are faced with a few Ps in our own experience. And I would like to suggest that these Ps that I'm going to share with you represent some attitudes and feelings that may hinder us as we leave this warm and cloistered atmosphere of fellowship. Uh, so let me share with you what I would suggest are the five P's that we need to think about. Uh, this would be the first one. I would like to suggest that we need to look at the P of procrastination. Nothing hinders progress more than procrastination. We procrastinate when we set goals and keep putting off every step necessary to achieve them. Any procrastinators in the audience here? Okay, we, you know, it's all right. Confession is good for the soul right about now. 
procrastination. There it can be no progress unless we first decide to move towards the destiny that God has in mind for us. As one writer put it, the best way to start realizing your dreams is to wake up. Millions of opportunities are lost each year because of procrastination. The procrastinator is the person who has the wisdom to know what to do, the skills to know how to do it, but lacks the will and power to get up and do it. I think of of Pharaoh as he was surrounded by the frogs there in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 10. Pharaoh had been given opportunity to obey God and remove them immediately or wait. And he said he would do it tomorrow. Thus, he spent another night with the frogs. Putting off things until tomorrow is actually condemned in Scripture. And there in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1 it says, Boast not thyself of what? Tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. If, my friends, there is a P that we should leave behind in this camp meeting going forward into the new year, it is the P of procrastination. The second P that I would like to bring to your attention is the P called the past. Too many of us try to march into the future dragging the past behind us. Oh, does somebody know what I'm talking about? As Israel moved towards their promised land, the month-long march became a 40-year journey because they tried to bring the past with them. They consistently brought up life in Egypt and God therefore let them wander and continue complaining about the past until there was no one left to bring up the past. Today, my friends, there are members who will leave this camp meeting, but they keep dragging up Egypt. Personal and family disputes and marital problems and financial difficulties which caused problems in the past are dead weight if they are dragged into the future. I would suggest, my friends, you think about what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14 when he said, forgetting those things which are what? Behind me and reaching forth unto those things which are before me. I I press towards the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. My friends, if there's a P that we need to leave behind at this camp meeting, it is the P of the past. What do you say out there? Another P that I'd like to suggest we need to leave behind is the P of pain. No year finishes without families experiencing some level of pain. Whether it is of sickness or death or finances or disappointments in marriage, every person experiences, my friends, some pain in his or her life. Yet we should not carry, my friends, the fear of pain or the memory of painful moments into the future. And why? It's because they have a tendency to absorb us and destroy us. Lot's wife, my friends, tried to walk forward. She was given a chance to climb the mountain, but the pain of the lost possessions, the lost dreams, the lost acquaintances overwhelmed her and she stopped and turned and looked back and found herself completely absorbed in the pain of the moment. And as a result, she was turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, I'd like to suggest, my friends, that we must carry the happy days of the past into the future and leave some of that pain behind. What do you say out there? Has there been bitter experiences in your past? Has there been? I'm sure we've all faced it. Well, leave it behind or it will drag you down. Psalms chapter 55 and verse 2 enlightens my heart because it says, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he will what? 
might sustain you and he will never suffer the righteous uh, to be moved. Finally, my friends, as we consider this new year, if you please, we must do as the children of Israel in Psalm 65. We must focus on the peace. Like Israel, we stand on the threshold of a brand new season. When we look back over the year that has passed since our last camp meeting, we recognize there have been some good days. There have also been some bad days. But the Lord, nevertheless, my friends, has showered down his blessings upon us in ways that cannot be measured. And we need, my friends, after this camp meeting to approach the new year with some new peas, uh, not pain and not procrastination and focusing on the past as we have done in other times. But we need some new peas. We need a positive attitude as as we come towards the close of this camp meeting. This is an attitude that says nothing will stop me from achieving my goals because I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What do you say out there? When the people of Israel, my friends, assembled itself at the beginning of the new season, the people looked back over the road that they had traveled. They looked forward with expectation of even greater things from God. Uh, they did not focus on the negative peas uh, that were out there. They did not focus on the problems or the prevarications or the perplexities or the pundits or the power-hungry pontificators within the church. Uh, they did not paint a pale picture of the prophets of doom that consumed them. Neither were they overwhelmed by the precise and the profound prostognations of the pagan prognosticators and those in the church who continue to turn around and say things won't work. They turned around and left those people and recognized they need to look forward. They were all influenced, my friends, not by any of the negative feelings about the future. They simply kept their eyes on the five Ps. What do you say out there? They came together, my friends, at the first of the new season and talked about the five Ps that would bring them blessings. They were not talking about black-eyed Ps. Uh, they were not talking about purple hulled peas. They were not talking about English peas, but their five peas defined their expectations. And it's the same five peas that should guide everyday believers in this day. They talked, my friends, about the P of performance. What do you say out there? If we are going to do what God wants us to do, if we're going to go where God wants us to go, if there's a blessing that's going to come our way, then you must recognize there in John John chapter 15 and verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. What do you say out there? They talk, my friends, about the P of prayer. Uh, God doesn't always answer our prayers in the way that we expect, but he does answer. To have faith and trust in God means that we recognize his activity in our circumstances, regardless of how hopeless it may seem in our eyes. Things may look like they're getting worse, that God has abandoned us, but God sees, as we have shared through this camp meeting, the big picture, and we can trust that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is at work even when we don't realize it. That's why I take comfort in the scripture there in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 that says and we know that all things work for uh, all things work together for good to those who love him those who have been called according to his purpose what do you say out there we know also as we've gone through this camp meeting that God is a prayer answering God if you can depend on the Lord, he will answer you on the by and by. There is, my friends, 
power in prayer. What do you say out there? There is power in prayer. There is strength in prayer because I am a testament and a witness and you are a testament and a witness that prayer changes things. We have heard testimonies of the praying mothers that have caused their sons and daughters to come home. We have heard of testimonies of wives praying for their husbands and making decisions for Jesus. And even when your child is in prison or a mental asylum, God is still there with them. Prayer changes things, my friends. They talked about the P of prevailing over temptations. Temptations, my friends, during this camp meeting will come and will go, but it doesn't matter what comes because the Lord won't allow anyone that trusts in him to be overtaken. Press on, my friends. That's what I'm going to tell you. Press on. Do you remember that song? Press along, saints. Press along in God's own way. Press along, saints. Press along. Persecution we must bear. Trials and crosses we must bear. But the hotter, the battle, the sweeter, the victory. Somebody say amen out here. That's why 1 Corinthians says, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above all that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you will be able to what? Bear it. Jesus knows and he will always make a way. The last of the, the, the second to last P, my friends, is the P of praise. They praise God before the year began for what was going to happen. In essence, they offered in January for February, they offered praise on the first Sabbath in January for what would happen in the last Sabbath of December. We should praise the Lord, not because we see the blessings, but because we anticipate it coming and we anticipate it, therefore we praise. We don't have to wait for the evidence because what did I teach you in Hebrews? That faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things things not seen. Therefore, we should praise God in anticipation that what our eyes are not able to see, ha, God is able. What do you say? We should praise the Lord for the burden he's going to lift off our shoulders. We should praise him for the hill he's going to help us to climb. We should praise the Lord for the bills he's going to help us to pay. And for the job he's going to help us to find. For the home he's going to help us to buy. He's going to help us. And finally, for some of the sisters, for the brother that's going to come your way. Oh, my friends, I want you to understand that when you pass that Red Sea place in your life where in spite of all that you can do, you've discovered there's no way out, there's no way back, there's no way other than through, then wait on the Lord with a trust that is secure uh, till the night of your fear is gone and he will send the wind, he will send the floods till your soul says, go on. Come here when I think about the Hebrew boys that the preacher preached this morning uh, bring me that pea. Uh, they were in the fiery furnace, but God from a pea protected them and he will protect you and he will keep you. What do you say out there? That is why Psalms chapter 27 verse 5 tells me, for in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me and he shall what? Set me up upon a rock, hallelujah, somebody. Uh, come here, widow woman. Uh, bring me that pea. Uh, she was down to her last drop of meal and oil and God, Jehovah, Jireh, his prevision activated his provision and he saw the need and provided in anticipation of the sacrifice of this woman. Uh, come here, Paul. Didn't you say in Philippines, but my God huh, shall supply all your needs according to his riches in what? Glory. Oh, oh, my friends, the last P was the P for purge. Even the Lord, though the Lord blessed us in this year, we ought to be glad that our sins did not follow us into the new year. We may have been purged and made pure, but what can wash away my sins and make me whole again? <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow 
that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing. Somebody say amen. Nothing. I said nothing. I said nothing but the blood of Jesus. So what I came by here to tell you, my friends, is that you may be pressed upon every side. But Christ will make sure that you are not crushed. You may be perplexed, but if you trust him, you will never despair. You may be persecuted, you may, but you will never be forsaken. You may be struck down, but hallelujah, you will not be destroyed. And those who bear the hallmark of the remnant, my friends, will come to that place where they will finally declare that they are part of the fellowship of the unashamed. We have, my friends, the fullness of Christ. The die has been cast. We've stepped over the line. A decision has been made. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We will not look back. We will not slow up. We will not back away. And we will not be still. Our past, my friends, is redeemed. Our present makes sense. And our future in Jesus is secure. I, my friends, want to get to that place where I'm finished and done with low living and worldly talking. I want to be done, my friends, with all of those things. I want to be in a place, my friends, where like Christ, I no longer need preeminence. I don't need prosperity. I don't need position. I don't need promotions. I don't need plaudits. And I don't need popularity. I don't have to be right anymore. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be tops. I don't have to be recognized. I don't have to be praised or and I don't need to be rewarded. I want to live by faith and lean upon his presence. What do you say out there? I want to walk by patience and I want to walk by prayer. My faith must be set. My gate must be fastened and my goal should be nowhere else but heaven, my friends. I know my road will be narrow and sometimes that way will be rough and my companions will be few but my guide is reliable and my mission is clear. The remnant, my friends, will not be bought. The remnant will Will not be compromised. The remnant will not be delayed. They will not be lured away. They will not be deluded or even delayed. They will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. They will not hesitate in the presence of adversity. They will not negotiate in the pool of the enemy, nor ponder in the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. Why? Because we are the children of God where we have received the power of the Holy Spirit. And when self is gone, and the Holy Spirit is within, this church will rise to be what God intended it to be. A light will come from this church as Revelation 18 declared that will lighten up the whole world and then will men know that Jesus is the Son of God because there is a people that will no longer conform, that will no longer behave in ways that are removed from the way God intended, but we will be the people that God intended us to be. That's what I came by here to tell you. That's all I came to tell you. That God wants a people. He wants a people. He needs a people. Not half in and half out. Not saying this works but not this. All or nothing. All or nothing. The faith of Jesus is all or nothing. All or nothing. What's this new year going to be like for you? Between this camp meeting and the next. Commitments, the five P's are there. Let this be a camp meeting like no other camp meeting, where it's not just about promises made, but where we act upon the promises made. Not by might, not by strength, but by the Spirit of God. Where we go and do what God says do. And even if it costs us, no that in his great plan up there is waiting for you a mansion streets paved with gold 
I like what Elder Wright says. We don't have to worry about too many different outfits. One robe fits all. I don't know what that means about weight and size, but it's going to fit everybody. Don't you want to be there? I want to be there. So why don't we stand and make that commitment to put into action what God says to you. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful time that we have had. The blessings that you've bestowed upon us in this camp meeting, you have come to us and blessed us far more exceeding abundantly than we could think or ask. We have been uh, to the mountaintop, oh Lord. We have experienced your presence, your Shekinah glory as we have fellowshiped in your presence over these days and, and we're soon to enter into the most high day, your Sabbath day, where we are entering into your very presence with the blessings that that you wish to bestow upon us. And then, Lord, when all is said and done, we will be packing up and heading down from the mountain, back to the plains and back to the cities and back to life and back to the families and back to husbands and back to reality. But what reality is, Lord, does not need to inform how we respond to it. But rather, Lord, you have given us in your word that you are more than able if we would simply empty and divest ourselves of self that you can lead us even through the valley of the shadow of death. Therefore, Lord, I commit before you all within the hearing of this verse, including myself, keep us, O Lord, as you have promised. And as the preacher said there in the adult youth, and as I've shared also, make us willing to be willing so that, Lord, we can come back the next camp meeting. And that time will simply be a time of testimonies of the great things that you have done for us. God bless, God keep us, and guide us now and forevermore. Let the church say amen. God bless everyone. God bless.